If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. The comments and views expressed on The More Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the views of Kevin Moore, The More Show, or this radio station and its affiliates or sponsors. Hello and welcome to another edition of The More Show, which is sponsored by the Mindscape magazine. On today's show, I'm about to be joined by actor, entertainer Kenny Baker. Now Kenny, who stands at 3 foot 8 inches tall, started his performing career in the 1950s, at the age of 16 joining the Burton Leicester Midgets. This was his first taste of show business, which led him to 9 years of touring the UK, doing pantos and various other acting jobs. Kenny also formed a successful comedy act called The Minitones, alongside entertainer and good friend Jack Purvis. But in 1977, George Lucas hired him to be the man inside R2-D2 in Star Wars Episode IV, A New Hope, eventually appearing in all six of the theatrical Star Wars films. His other movie credits to name a few include The Elephant Man, Time Bandits and Jim Henderson's Labyrinth. Kenny Baker, welcome to the show. Thank you. We're going to talk about your new book from Tiny Acorns. Um, let's start from the beginning here, Kenny. Let's start from, tell me about your parents and um, what they used to do and how that influenced you to become a performer. My father was a draftsman and a bass player. And he, was a, he could make furniture and he could, uh, he was a general, you know, who could do anything really. Built a caravan with his brother and... Uh, he painted oil paintings. You know, he was an all-round artist, really. Yeah, but was it this artistic side of your father that got you into wanting to perform, you know, wanting to act? Yeah, well, no, well, not really, no. I mean, my, my parents um, divorced when I was about seven, so I went into a, a boarding school in Seven Oaks in Kent. OK, so you're at boarding school. Your mother and father have separated. Um, what happens after boarding school? Do you go back to live with your mother or your father? Has your mother remarried or what, what happens? Uh, no, well, while I was at boarding school, I, my, my mother went to America with, with a GI at the end of the war. In 1946 or seven. she went there. And I was in Kent. And then when I left, then my father died. We were going to go to to Australia. We were going to emigrate. He, he remarried a dancer from Blackpool or, or Manchester, and her mother had a hotel in Hastings. So um, she was down there with my little sister at the time, called Carol. And I left school in Seven Oaks in Kent, which is not far from Hastings, and went down there. But she couldn't look after me because she was looking after her mother and the hotel and Carol. So I was in foster care for a while in Silver Hill, just up the hill from uh, St. Leonard, Leonard's in um, Hastings. I met a little lady in the street one day, and, and I, she said, well, oh, hello, who are you? And I, I said, well, I'm Kenny Baker, and um, she said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm going to come and see the show tonight at the, at the Regal. It was the Letters Midgets, about 20 midgets and dwarfs. And I just thought I'd come and see the show. She said, oh, good. And then uh, he said, well, come round afterwards and meet me, but are you working? And I said, no, I just left school. I said, what are you going to do? I said, I have got a clue, to be honest. I, you know, I wanted to be a commercial artist like my dad was, but uh, I didn't have the talent, really. I wasn't, you know, that clever, really. And, uh, and I, didn't, I wasn't an instrumental guy. I wasn't a singer. I wasn't a dancer. You know, I didn't really know what to do. Hey, I went back to round stage, and she, he said, yeah, you know, I'll take you, we'll, we'll find you something to do, and he, he said, well, we'll start in January at the, at the Metropolitan Theatre in Edgware Road, London, 
this is about September, I think, something like that. And I said, oh, okay then, so he said, oh, five pound a week on tour. <laughs> you know, that was, even nowadays you can't get a meal for five pound. And I was on tour for the whole week on a, on a fiver. I went with the show for about three years. And uh, then TV came in and uh, uh, that killed the theatres, really. Now, Kenny, um, when you was with the Leicester Midgets, uh, this was around the time that you met uh, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. Um, what were they like? Yeah, I met them in South End, yeah. Well, you know, they're just, just two comedians who uh, came on a stage at the, uh, I think it was the Odeon Cinema. And we, we were in we were in South End at another one, the Regal, I think we were at, for the week. And uh, they came in on a Saturday morning with the kids, you know, children's shows on Saturday morning with cartoons and a newsreel. And, uh, and then we, they showed a low and hardy film, and then at the end of the film they came on stage. The kids couldn't believe it, you know. And we were in the audience, most of us, most of the little guys I was in the, sh- in the show. And uh, we went backstage to see him, that was all. And uh, signed him a photograph for me. And that was it, really. Great. Nice people. Nice. They were, you know, pros, aren't they? Yeah, of course they were. And do you still have the photograph that they signed for you? Yeah, oh yeah, of course, yeah. Now, after you left the uh, Burton Midgets uh, in, in Leicester, you joined, eventually, the Billy Smart Circus. And from that landed your first film role. Um... Did you get to star alongside Donald Pleasance in that film role? And uh, what was the film called? Donald Pleasance? Oh, I don't remember being seeing him. I was in the Circus of Horrors. Yeah, he was probably in it, because it was the final kind of film he'd be in. Cir- the Circus of Horrors, it was called. And it was at, um, filmed, the bit I did, it was filmed at the Clapham Common in South London, uh, where the smart circus it used to be on there for about a month just before Christmas. And that's where I did that film. Uh, did I, you know, it was all right, but I only had a small part. I was a, I was a clown. And I was on the rope of the aerialist and all that. Oh, I was a ringmaster, that's right, dressed as a ringmaster with a top hat and a red coat. And I rode a, Ch- a Shetland pony in the parade and in, in the finale, a black Shetland pony. And uh, that was about it. Yeah, it was a work, a, a job for me. And I lived in Clapham at the time, luckily, in a flat for three pound a week in a flat in uh, something Grove, something gro- Grove, just near Clapham tube station. Then from there, and I, I got into the uh, Michael Sullivan, who was Shirley Bass's manager, uh, booked me for an ice show at Norwich. And I went and did the ice show at Norwich. He said, can you skate? I said, well, I can roller skate. So he said, well, go down to Stratton and learn to ice skate if you can. I said, well, I should be able to if I can roller skate. And that's what I did. So I went to Norwich for, for about six weeks, I think it was, in the, at the, um, the Hippodrome. I don't think it's there anymore. And it's Theatre Royal. It's a big one there. It's a nice, nicer theatre. It's still there, that one is. And then I did that one, I met all the ice skating people, and they said, well, you want to go to Blackpool, really? You have 20 weeks in the middle of the summer. All over 20 weeks, a good long season. So I got into the ice show at Blackpool in, in 1954, that was. That's just, 1953 was a bad year for theatres, with, with the TV coming out. And that, and that was the year the Queen was, was crowned as the Queen in 1953. Anyway, I got with the ice show, and then I, I, I thought, well, what am I going to do in the winter, you know? So I, I, I had my stepmother, I, I had my stepmother's connections around Manchester, and stayed there for a while. And then I got a, I got a job at the Ritz in uh, in Whitworth Street, Mecca Ballroom. And then I, was, I, I got a job with pantomime with Emil Littler, then in Babes in the Wood. So I got this trio going. I had the pantomime every year for six years in in, in uh, Babes in the Wood. Then I had the summer season at Blackpool for six years in a d- different show every year at the, at the um, Pleasure Beach. 
And then I, in between these two shows, I did the, the Ritz at Whitworth Street. Just as a host, really, I opened the door and I sold raffle tickets and played a harmonica with the band, you know, did yeah. a few numbers on the harmonica with them. And it was a good good uh, trio of, of the show, you know, I did it for six years. OK, well, let's just take this forward to the early part of the 1960s. And this is the time where you got a part in uh, Snow White and where you met uh, your long-term friend, uh, Jack Purvis, who played a considerable role in your life, would you say, Kenny? Well, he, got, he saw the advert in the, in the Sunday Express or some regular paper in London and uh, wanted for ice show, you know, little guys for, for, who could skate. Because uh, there weren't many around, you know, really. And uh, he said he could skate. He didn't, he used to, go a, while, a few skating trips to Haringey, which is his nearest ice rink, I think. Anyway, we met at the wardrobe uh, in uh, just off Piccadilly. Uh, London, what were they called now? London, something or other. And uh, the office was Tom Arnold and Gordon Blackie with the agent. And he said, well, you know, we'll have you as dopey and you put, and Jack, who was my partner there, he, he, well, he was eventually. Jack's playing bashful. And they had all the, all the little guys lined up, more or less. And we went into that, that was in 1960. Snow White on Ice. And we toured with that for quite a while. And, uh, and then they, they kept stopping these ice shows. They, they just, like, season somewhere and then they'd stop. And then that, then they do a summer show somewhere, and that would stop, of course. And then, and they might send a tour, or they might send a show to. Uh, they went, we went to Dublin uh, with the ice I shows. Oh, they did summer season at, at Ramsgate, summer season at uh, Morecambe, summer season at Paynton, summer season in Brighton. Yeah. Plus the winter seasons, you know, as well. So that was a lucky break in with the ice shows. And in between all these breaks, Jack and I formed a double act called the Minitone. And we got quite doing quite well, you know. Huey, we were with Huey Green's Opportunity Knox. And nearly won that a few times. We did it two or three times. We nearly won it a few times, but uh, they were looking for recording material, really. And, and those acts, mainly, like they do now with the uh, you know, X Factor. They're looking for recording people, really. Yeah. Yeah. Not, you know, not acrobats or magicians or anything like that. They want singers, don't they? That's right. So they can make more money out of them, you see. So anyway, uh, we got the, old, the act going on. We went to Germany first because we thought, well, if we're a bad act, nobody will know about it in Germany. <laughs> or over here. So we, we did start it off in Germany, really. And then we got the working men's clubs all over the place. And we were doing pretty well, you know. We were one of the top acts in in the London area at the time. And unusual acts, of course, a musical. You know, I played harmonica and vibraphone. And Jack played his trumpet, and he did most of the talking. It was good comedy act. It worked quite well. We, we, you know, one was... I figured my, I was a straight man. And he was a comic. But in, in some ways, I was a comic. And I was doing facial expressions while he was doing his, his verbal stuff, you know. And it, it worked, or whatever it, it was. Worked, it worked, yeah. It worked very well. Yeah, yeah. it worked quite well. It's like yeah. Malcolm and Wise, you know. They, they were both comics in a way, really. But they, they really, we, uh, Eric was the comic, and uh, Ernie was the straight man. But, but we played instruments, which it, they didn't do that. They were purely sing they're talkers. And they weren't singers either. We sang a few times. We weren't singers either, but we got away with it. Yeah, you got away with it, but uh, you made it very successful. Well, we enjoyed it. It was a good act, so we really enjoyed it. And then we got in with, with Pontins, and then we got in with Warners, and one or two Butlins, and then uh, Pantomimes, you know, we, we played with, uh, in, in the Snow White and Seven Dwarfs on ice, as well as on stage, with Linda Lusardi. We, we, we did about six years with, with Linda. So we, we got on really well with Linda. She's a nice girl. Now, was it not true that you met your wife through a letter that she sent to you after she saw a TV appearance of yourself and she was intrigued by the um, interview that took place after? And I believe I believe you was on the Dave Allen show. 
Oh, that was right, yeah, because I did a few shows with Dave That's Allen. That's right. An Irish comedian. And I have sketches all over the place, you know. We, I did, I, we did Dave Allen. Uh, uh, then I did a few shop spots on my own with with uh, whoever, you know, with uh, Dick Emery and uh, Tommy Cooper and uh, uh, all the stacks of people, really. Lots of whatever was on, I was usually on it. And sometimes Jack was with me as well. And uh, and I we, I was in um, I don't know where I was, but a letter got to me via Dave Allen from a girl in Preston called Eileen, and she wanted to know how to how you to cope with a dwarf or a midget because a, a neighbour of theirs had a, a a baby boy, and she didn't know how to cope with a boy, you know, and she wanted to know what the situation was with a with a boy. So I said. Well, I did. I had to make a difference, really. You're just a baby, but boy or a girl. There's no difference to anybody else. You just just happen to be a bit smaller than everybody else. You know, you you can be physically uh, a little bit... Uh, I'm, I'm a bit physically not quite as, as I could be because I've got short arms and short fingers as well as quite short legs. So um, that doesn't help at the times, especially now I'm getting older. But anyway... So that's how I got into it, you see, and I, and I was working at the Winter Gardens at Morecambe in Snow White on Ice. And I thought, well, Preston's not far away, so I gave her a ring, and we, we met in the August, I think, my birthday time. And uh, I took her to, to the casino in Blackpool, and we went to the Water Rats. Um, you had a yearly party at Blackpool with all the artists that were in Blackpool at the time. Like, there were 14 live shows in Blackpool, would you believe? Uh, with circus, you know, ice shows, not three piers, winter gardens, the opera house. Uh, uh, anyway, well, there were fourteen altogether, uh, and um, and so uh, I saw Eileen at the party at the casino, and uh, we got engaged. And uh, and she said, "Well, what are we going to do? What are you doing at Christmas?" I said, "Well, we're going down to Paynton in Devon." Near Torquay, with Snow White on ice again, you know, uh, on a stage. Can they carry a tank of? They can fit up the ice sheet on a tank. So, and I said, well, all I could do is get a caravan, and we can go take the caravan out of the paint, which is what we did. But so we got married in the, excuse me, in, in December, and and the next. On the Friday, I think it was, or the Saturday, and on the Sunday we travelled down to Birmingham, where I came from, and uh, stayed in the at the, um, what's it the hotel in Hurst Street near the near the Hippodrome in Birmingham, and then we uh, went stayed there with Donald Pierce was in there at the time. Incredible. Yeah, and uh, said hello. Where's your wife? I said she's upstairs. So he said, "Well, get her down. We'll have another glass of champagne and or another bottle of champagne." And, uh, and that, you know, you know, then we had to travel all the way down to Paynton the next day with a caravan, tr- towing a caravan. And that's how I got married and uh, started off my life with Eileen. Okay. okay, okay. So you, so you could say that right. no, you could say that 1969 was a very special year for you then, basically. Oh, it was a good year, 1969. That was when the Concord first flew. And the men on the moon, they, 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 land, they took off for the moon. I was in 69, because I was in Morecambe at the time, and when they landed on the moon, and, uh, and then the Concorde flew that time. I don't quite know exactly when that took off, but it all happened, you know, it was a, it was a good year for me, that was, 69. Good, good, good. The 60s were the best time, actually, I think, for everybody, because all the clubs and all the theatres were going, and, and uh, well, most of the theatres, so, the big theatres, anyway. The West End was buzzing like crazy, you know, and the, the Beatles were and the Stones, and all those, you know, top the Searchers and the, all kinds of good acts were running around, you know, doing big shows at big. Uh, then they they brought, brought these clubs out with rest a restaurant side, we could sit down and have a meal and watch a show at the same time, and they, they were packed out coaches from all over the place. And to see Dave Allen at Watford, and the big uh, club, Bailey Clubs, they, they started off in Sunderland and gradually worked their way south. And they got as far as Watford, Bailey Clubs, you know, very well run. 
and Blazers at Windsor was another good club. And no, uh, oh, you, you thought, well, this this is never going to end, you know. But all these things do. They don't seem to last all that long. Well, that's it, Kenny. The word is change. Everything changes. Change so quickly. I can't stand all this screaming and shouting and at, at these TV shows like X Factor. You know, I just can't stand it. It doesn't make any sense to me. They have accents on. They can't possibly hear what they're singing or what they're talking about because they're too busy screaming. I mean, it's crazy. I, I just turn it off. I can't be bothered to watch it. And then, I mean, they don't have... And then they've got judges, a panel of judges. And then they say, well, it's up to the audience, you know, the man in the street to judge. And they haven't got a clue. You know, they haven't got a clue, most of them anyway. And um, I think, well, you know, they've got acts, people on that who should never, ever have started in the first place, you know. And yet they vote for them because they go, oh, what a shame, you know. And they get the sympathy vote. vote. Yeah, you've got some good points there, Kenny. Um, you know, the X Factor is not, it's not my cup of tea. But, um, you know, I suppose it is just light entertainment. So, um, OK, well, let's just skip forward to uh, 1971. And I believe, was that the year that your first son, Kevin, was born? Well, no, we had Chris first, that's right. Chris was the oldest, and then Kevin. Now, at the time when you had your kids, uh, you, you know, you was a full-time dad. You know, you're, you're an actor, entertainer. Um, but also... Your wife um, wasn't very well at that time, neither was she. Well, she had epilepsy, you see. I didn't know that until I'd married her, really. And she told me, but I, and I'd see the mild attack, and it, it, it's a bit scary, you know, frightening, really. But you, you just get used to them. There's nothing you can do about no, it. No, you, you've got to live with it and support them, that's yeah. right. She was getting worse and worse and gradually worried about it, you know. And, and uh, it was a bit grim for her, really. And I couldn't leave her alone, really. I couldn't just take off if, if she wasn't well, you know, if she was being ill with uh, epilepsy. So I thought, well, I'd better move out of Bush here in Hertfordshire and move up here, which is what I did, you see. And then I went down south for everything, any job that came up. And just had to put up with it, you see. And then Jack, my partner, said, well, I think that's the end of our double act because you're too far away. I and mean, he lived in Bushy as well. We both lived nearby each other. By design, so that we could travel in each other's cars, you know, whichever. And um, he said, that's the end of the double act, really, isn't it? I said, no, well, not really. I mean, we, we can still do summer season, and we can still do Christmas pantomime season. And maybe go on our own ways in between. Which we did, really, for about, well, not long. And then Jack had an accident with his car. Well, before we go there, let's just go to the year 1976, where you receive a call from your agent of then, Johnny Laycock, who informed you that he had heard a whisper from the owner of a club where you worked at um, that some American people were in town looking for a, a small person to fit inside a robot. Oh, that was in the 1970s. Well, Jack and I were working around the London area all the time, basically. Southeast, anyway, of London, England. So, you know, anywhere, sort of, draw a line across from King's Lynn to Birmingham and to Wales, and that, and we'd work south of that line, really. And go, we can drive out, do a show, and drive home again. We were in the area in London, and our, our agent was just down the road in Bushy as well. And he got word of it from another agent friend of his to say that there was a guy called Lucas in town looking for somebody small to be in the robot. So they sent me down, or my agent did. And I said, well, what about Jack? He said, well, there'll you know, probably be parts in the film for Jack as well. So we went, I went down there and then walked in the room and they said, oh, yeah, you'll do, because I was the right height, really. And that was all it amounted to. Right. You know, yeah, you'll do. And uh, I, I didn't want to do it because I was doing, op- we, well, we were doing Opportunity Knox for, for Huey Green at the time. And I didn't really want to be stuck in a robot, but I thought, well, oh, well, I might as well. I can do the filming in the daytime and, and the cabaret in the London area at night, you know, as well as the TV bits. So, you know, it worked out very well, really. So That's you, what I did. So you wasn't originally going to take the part of R2-D2 only because uh, Jack wasn't going to have a part in it himself. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, well, yeah, I said to Lucas and whoever was around at the time, 
hey, what, what about Jack? You know, and they thought, oh, don't worry, there's plenty of little parts we can give Jack, which is what they did. Can I can I ask you, Kenny, when you took the part to take R two D two, did you go with your gut feeling? Well, they all knew me down the south. You see, most of the people, agents and and people knew me, and I'd done other, you know, like the circus of horrors and bits of TV bits. And then, uh, they, so everybody knew me, so I, I just walked into the part. So, what was it like then, Kenny, being inside the R2-D2 robot? Well, it wasn't very comfortable, really, at first. It was a few sharp edges here and there, and nails and screws and things sticking out inside, which I had to get sorted out. And cables everywhere, wiring everywhere with the, with the electric lights on, and a battery inside making a noise to... That's, you know, for the electric lights. And a battery was between my legs, and uh, it wasn't very comfortable. It was noisy. And it was heavy, weighed, weighed about 80 pounds. So it wasn't very comfortable, but I put up with it, you know, I thought it's better than... I don't want to lose the power, really. No, that's right. And, uh, you know, was it good money for the time? It was, no, no, it was not good, really. And I said, well... If you can give me the same money as I'm getting in the cabaret, and I, in case I don't get to do any more cabaret, with filming all day, you know, you don't feel much like going, like to, going out to work again in the evening as well. But that's what we did. That's what I did anyway. We, we didn't work every night in cabaret. We worked like Wednesdays, Fridays and Saturdays. And what was it like to work with uh, George Lucas? Oh, he's great. Nice bloke, George. Yeah. He knows what he's doing. He's got his, his head screwed on. He knows what he wants. And he, he's a good director. He, he knows exactly what he wants. So when he tells you to do something, you know it'll be right, you know. And that was all it was. He was an easy guy to get on with. And was you aware at the time of how much Star Wars would change your life? No, nobody knows, do they? They guess they're going to hope they're going to be good. I think George must have done, you know. And Alec Guinness was in it, and I thought, if Alec Guinness is in it, it must be going to be pretty good, otherwise he wouldn't be in it. And he knows more about filming than anybody. At least he knows more than I do what was going to happen. But I didn't... So I never made a fortune, but we did okay, you know. Not complaining, really. And what was it like to work alongside Sir Alec Guinness? Well, they're, they're actors, you know. They're just people that go into a film and act the part, and then go home and, and then wait for the next one. So, you know, they were usually quite friendly and nice people. Now, when Star Wars began filming in 1976, I believe it was one of the hottest years on record. Um, so what was that like, being confined inside the R2-D2 machine? Un- uncomfortable, really. And hot, most of the time. Because there's always hot. Well, it was in 76, which is a hot summer. But that was one of the hottest years we had. And also, if you get into a studio, a sound stage with no, you know, there's no air getting into the place, so it, it gets hotter and hotter with all the lights. So that was uncomfortable, eventually. No, it's just one of those things, you've just got to get used to it. Now, did you not take Mark Hamill and uh, Curry Fisher into London to watch you perform as the uh, Minitones? Well, we did that. We did our show for a a rap party one year, because we did the show for three or four years, you know, Star Wars, lasted from 76 to 82, uh, and there was a break in between, wasn't there, and we did another three films, four, five, and six, 90, in the mid-90s, anyway, so, you know, that first lot, it was good, it was, we were, like, younger than we were, and we were doing well with films as well as cabaret. And uh, we we were out to Canada and uh, New Zealand and South Africa without Star Wars, doing other stuff, you see. And so we were we were having a great time, really. Yeah. And we were both married, and Jack had three kids, and I had two. And we had our own houses, and we always had a nice car to get to, you know, so that it was reliable to get us to the gigs. And getting home two o'clock in the morning, you don't want to rack the old car. So we we were lucky when you know we we got to the and then we got to the the next tri- trilogy, which were the not they weren't there weren't so many actors in it really not just the main parts like Mark Hamill and uh, Carrie and uh, Darth Vader, Jeremy Bullock, 
and Peter Mayhew and myself, four of us, and then there was Anthony Daniels, of course, who was C-3PO. So we were in it, but there weren't really many big stars in the next three. And the occasional American came in and went out again, you know, of the movie. Yeah. I mean, you did star alongside Peter Cushing as well. I mean, you know, that guy was a cult figure, um, you know, in, in the Dracula series and the, and, and the Hammer uh, movie studios. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right, all the, all the buddies. It's good, it's interesting, you know, you can meet these people. And, and I haven't seen my Harrison Ford, I don't think, since, since the first three films. And because he did very well the Indiana Jones movies, you know, for, for Lucasfilm. So uh, he's a big star now in America. But but at the time, Kenny, did you know he was going to be such a big movie star? Well, he, he did American Graffiti. That's the film he first started with, with Lucas. And then he went from that to Star Wars. And then he's done all lots of big movies since then, hasn't he? It's done very well. Um, I, I don't know what Mark Hamill's done, really. And uh, 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 Anthony Daniels hasn't done anything, I don't think. Carrie Fisher's always buzzing around. But there's only Dave Prowse and Peter Mayhew, and Jeremy Bullock and myself uh, going around all the uh, conventions all over the world. I heard, Kenny, that uh, Mark Hamill charges about $50,000 for an interview, is that right? It's ridiculous, isn't it? I don't know they've got the nerve to do it. I certainly don't charge that much. Um, I don't think he wants to do it, really. That's why he, he charges such a lot. You know, he thinks, well, I don't want to do it, because you know, he doesn't want to come over here much. So he, char- he asks for a lot of money. Sometimes he gets it. Now, there was a programme on Channel 4 called Bring Back Star Wars, and on that, both yourself and Anthony Daniels, C-3PO, um, both commented on how difficult it was to work with each other. Was he, hard, was he, Anthony, difficult to work with? I don't know why he is difficult to everybody. Even the, even the fans, you know, the, the fan club people. Uh, he's, he's, he's never spoke, speaks to me, never speaks to Jeremy. So I give it up with him. I tried for years. I said to him, you know, we should go out together, you and me, as we like to see on the screen together. <laughs> said to me, oh, I don't do many of these, and, and that's it. Closes the book, as it were. So I don't bother anymore with him, you know, I can't be bothered. In fact, you know what, they, they just brought out a commercial now for Curry's. That's right, I've seen it. Yes, it's even me, isn't it? Yeah, it is you both. And I didn't know anything about it till about two days ago. Well, it can only keep your profile up, Kenny. It won't be bad, will it? And it falls down, doesn't it? And the robot falls on its face. No, it's actually a really good advert, and we'll actually put a link for the advert on, onto our webpage for you as well. So, um, so continuing on with the Star Wars theme, Kenny, um, how big were the sets? Well, it took a whole... whole like, a, uh, like an aeroplane hangar in the, the studio. Uh, sound stages. I made about five or six of these. Oh, they were fantastic sets. And uh, what was it like to have all the cast under one roof? What was it like? What are you? Well, you're, you're filming, you're making a film, you know. I, don't, I wasn't always, we weren't always in there every day. I mean, if you weren't in a particular scene, and they were going to take a, a one or two days to, to, to film it. So you had two, one or two days off, you know. You weren't, you weren't with everybody all the time. No. And also, you don't often see the person. Some people will come into a film and say their lines and go home and you not see them again. You probably have never met them, you know. Yeah. Because we did La- Labyrinth and Willow and... Uh... That's right. We're going to come on to uh, Willow and Labyrinth in a minute. But um, out of all the Star Wars films, Kenny, that you starred in, um, what was your favourite Star Wars film? Oh, I think The Empire Strikes Back is about the best. Well, we, I, we, most of us think the same. They're all good in their own way, you know. Jedi was good with the Ewoks. What I've heard from the fans is that what let the last three most recent Star Wars films down was the the high use of CGI. Yes. Well, that's well, of course. I mean, that's what all the actors would think anyway, wouldn't they? 
because it's not it's not, you're not acting obviously it, it's it's you know CGI or whatever you call it which is not doing the business much good I don't think really but there again the kids don't know do they they like to you know the younger generation they they don't re recognize an actor you know they don't realize that whether it's a good acting or bad acting you know it's just a, a big event isn't it a, a film uh, for, for kids that's right so you know they're quite happy with the new ones as well as as what we were with the first ones you know that's uh, what the heck it doesn't matter as long as as long as everybody's happy but to sum up Star Wars, Kenny, I mean, what's it mean to you that you starred in these iconic movies that, that are going to be there for generations upon generations? Well, I'm very lucky in that respect, you know. I think, well, it can't go on forever, but it seems to be going on forever, doesn't it? So let's hope it does. Well, Star Wars 3D gets released in uh, 2012, I believe. Yes, that's right. 3D. They're going to... I don't know how they're going to do that, but they're going to make them into 3D somehow. But, so, I mean, it seems like that commercial that's come out this week on t TV with, for Curry's. So there they go. So it's going to start doing things like that. It can't, can't even be good for us, as you said before. So um, I'm just ticking over, really. I'm just doing the occasional show, about two a month at the most, at the moment. Which is fine for me. I don't want to go working backside off all over the, the world, you know. I only, I only want to try, stay in Europe. Now, I don't go... I can't fly to America anymore. It's at the, um, the recycled air on the aeroplanes doesn't do my chest any good. You know, it's, I collapsed on the way back from from Chicago a couple of years ago now and um, nearly died of pneumonia, so they tell me. I passed out completely. So I'm frightened to go any further than Europe now. The two-hour flights are enough for me. You've got to look after yourself. Yeah, it's not worth getting killed, is it, just to sign a few autographs, you know. They can come to you. That's right. Now, Kenny, tell me about your meeting with the legendary boxer, Muhammad Ali. Well, Jack and I were doing a charity show in Holloway, and, uh, and Muhammad Ali was there. Kerry Cooper, uh, all the boxers that you could wish for were there, really. Uh, 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 I can't remember all the names of them now. No, we knew, I knew all the boxers of the, of the 60s and 70s. Incredible. And, uh, and Muhammad Ali was there, and, he, and uh, I said to him, this is my wife, Eileen. And he looked down and he said, oh, you, she's really pretty. And then he looked at her and he said, couldn't you have done better than that? Okay, okay. So yeah, I thought better not hit him. Yeah, he's a good, like, nice fellow he was. He was very, very witty, wasn't he? He, was, he did the Parkinson show a few times, and he was, you know, he was very witty, really. Now, one of your iconic films that you starred in was uh, Time Bandits, which is also one of my favourite films. So uh, tell me about your experience on uh, on that film. Well, that was a good film. You know, I enjoyed that more than most of the Star Wars films, really. It was good fun to make, you know, and there were six of us in that, and all the little fellas got on well with each other. And there was nobody, like, uh, anybody that we didn't get on with. And uh, it was just a good film. Michael Palin and, uh, you know, there were all actors and actresses. Anybody was good. And it's the only film, apart from Star Wars, that the Americans know me from, you know, they all know me from from Time Bandits in America, because it was very popular over there. They're very happy with um, Monty Python type stuff in, in America. And the only people really have done well over there was was Benny Hill and uh, and and uh, Time Bandits, you know, which were very English at the time. And uh, strange, that not it? But it's it's a great script. It's it's a great film. Yeah, it was a good film. So, who were some of the more major actors that you met while filming Time Bandits? Well, I, well, I knew the people in the film. Well, there was uh, Sean Connery, wasn't there? Sean Connery was only one scene. Well, the one scene that we were with him when he was the king. Uh, uh, he played a king at one time. Then he played a fireman, 
at the end of the film, which I, I wasn't in that, on that scene. And he was a king in Morocco on horseback. I didn't go to Mor Morocco. I didn't see him there. You know, there were scenes in these, so you don't meet everybody all the time, you know. So, uh, but it, 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 all of them were good. You know, the American was good. There was, a, there was Michael Palin, of course, and... Uh, uh, what's, uh, I've forgotten the name now. I can't remember the American woman. Hellman, Hellman, somebody Hellman. All good actresses. Now, another pioneering um, film producer that you worked with was um, Jim Henson. Could you just tell us what it was like to uh, work with Jim? Uh, well, Jim Henson, he was a guy that did all the Muppets and, uh, didn't he, all the Muppet stuff. And, uh, you see, I didn't, we, had, we were always stuck inside costumes. So you didn't always get chance to meet people because you were stuck inside these costumes. <laughs> you couldn't talk. And you were lucky if you could see where you were going about the mind talking to people. And, they, well, you know, they always kept putting little people in, in little costumes, little animals or something. So I wasn't very comfortable. That would get, you know, I, I, that was that Labyrinth, that one, wasn't it? And we were in Willow as well. There were a lot of people in Willow. And um, that we weren't inside a costume there. Willow was quite a good film. Good for Warwick Davis. He went out to New Zealand with that. And Jack and I were in it, and we were asked if we would go as well to New Zealand. But we were doing a summer show in, in, in this country at the time. So, even for Warners, I think it was. And uh, you enjoyed filming Willow? Willow, yeah, that could film, yeah, it's OK. And now, at this time, was it not your stage partner, Jack Purvis, uh, your stage partner of the Mini Tomes, that had an awful, tragic accident? And uh, what, what could you tell us what happened? Yeah, in 91 he did. He had the accident. Yeah, the car went back in his driveway and he tried to stop it physically. and went, He went back with the car and went through the gatepost wrought iron gates and uh, broke his neck and uh, landed on the pavement uh, and the car cr crossed the street. Good job nobody was around at the time. It would have been a worse accident than it was. But Jack was on the pavement and he didn't know it, but he, he couldn't feel his feet and all that. And a woman said, and, and you're right, he said, well, don't, pick, don't move me. Because I told you I, I told you I can move my back or anything. So anyway, she phoned the ambulance from his house, and um, paramedics came, and that was the end of that. That was the end of the, the show, really, for me and Jack. He was completely paralysed. So that was the end of the mini tomes, then. The end of the mini tomes, yeah, terrible. It was really worse. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't wish that on your worst on your worst enemy, because you know he was completely paralysed from the neck downwards. Couldn't do anything at all. Couldn't scratch his nose. Couldn't do anything. Did it make you appreciate life more when that happened? Oh, I should say so. Yeah, you, you begin to think how lucky you are, you know. If you've got any... I'm a bit fed up with myself now at the moment because I've got... My wife died. Jack was... Well, Jack's dead now. He, he lasted six years. As he was, it was like a living death for him anyway, you know, really. So all he could do is sit in a chair and watch TV. Couldn't even talk properly. Cause he had a, and a breathing machine. It was terrible. Anyway, he lasted about six years, till about 90, from 91 to 96, when he died. And I was, I was um, with Eileen, you know, my wife, and she died in 93, about three, two years after Jack's accident. So suddenly I've got, you know, my mum and dad had died, and I left school, and my mum and dad had died. And, you know, I didn't know, it wasn't all sort of, fairy lights and uh, show business and all that jazz. It was pretty grim around t at some time. So when Jack passed away then, Kenny, um, did you try to keep the mini tones act going? I had to struggle along on my own after that. Got a solo act, went out to Spain, went to Benidorm and the, and the Canaries. And I was doing OK, but I wasn't really as good as, as Jack and me as a, as a double act. So the accident... Uh, not an accident, my accident, no, when I passed out from Chicago. Um, I'd been a bit fed up at times, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck here on my own. I, I didn't have a dog because I thought, well, I, I can't 
walk about with a dog very easily now myself, you know. I haven't got the energy that I used to have. Well, look, Kenny, I appreciate the time you've given us for this interview. And uh, just to sort of summarise this, is there any message you'd like to give to your fans? Just to say a um, big thank you to all the fans that show up at these fun- functions, uh, you know, conventions and what have you. And uh, I can't believe my luck, really. I'm still going to these places and signing autographs and whatever. It's, it's great, you know, what more can I say? I just, if hopefully it'll go on for a lot as well, long as I'm here, and probably longer, probably go go on for a few more years yet. You never know, do you? Just been this out in 3D. They'll buy all the things again, won't they, in 3D? So that should cause another round of uh, autograph signings with a bit of luck. And your new book, uh, The Kenny Baker Story, is available from your website, kennybaker.co.uk. Yeah. And I believe that you offer a autographed uh, book as well. Yeah, yeah, there's a guy called Ken Mills. He's looking after my w- website for me. He's taking all the books, orders. It's on, it's on the internet. Well, Kenny Baker, all I can say is it's been a pleasure to have you on. You're an absolute legend. Thank you very much. To find out more information on Kenny Baker, go to kennybaker.co.uk or visit my site, themoreshow.co.uk and look up Kenny Baker under past guests. Well, do remember that you can now follow us on Facebook. Uh, If you go to the More Show website, there'll be a Facebook link where you can keep up to date on all the latest news and uh, guests coming on the show. So until next time, be safe. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows.